the interesting thing is that 3PO in many ways is the the storyteller of the movie as we know that he is the almost the spokesperson of the movie because mm -hmm. um, that's the way George Ford had it. Right. And somehow some kind of osmosis has happened or some kind of cross uh, bridging has happened between us that um, more and more that I do talk as myself and people don't run screaming from the building saying he's not wearing the mask, he's not, it's Anthony Daniels face, that they can cope with it. That because I can string a sentence together, because I like art, because I like and appreciate music, um, that I can not just talk about girls hard in the casting sort, sort of thing. But that Because I want to to hold Star Wars at a level above uh, the ordinary. And because of its eternal popularity and respect, I also have to treat it with respect. But it's interesting because the thing that drew you to this sort of role is the art of Ralph McCoy. As you've discussed many times and as we talked a few months, a few years ago, sitting beneath Ralph, conceptual rendering of C3PO, that is the thing that drew you to this from the very beginning was an artwork, was a piece of two-dimensional artwork and the humanity and warmth that you saw hidden within that robotic creation. And it's absolutely true. It, it maybe sounds a bit contrived or made up, but it's absolutely not, because until that moment I had no interest. Right. Um, and that stays with me now. And my fondness for the character allows me to put up with, you know, it's not always easy, frankly. And certainly, to you know, I was wearing it fairly recently for uh, another project with Disney, which has just been announced, the re remaking of Star Tours. So I was back in this costume um, in, uh, in uh, California. And much as I love him, through Pio, uh, being him is difficult. <laughs> being his voice in Clone Wars is, is fun, but you know, his voice is quite hard to reproduce because you, you, there's a tension about him. Right. And if you're doing hours of that, you end up, no matter how, as an actor, you, you relax and whatever. I'm always like this when I'm creepy here because this is, you know, the way he is. He's very stiff. Right. And so I make my body stiff too because that way we can make that little bridge between the two of us. <laughs> my. So there have been times when I end up going, oh, you know, I can't. And I, there's times I've had to stop during the day because the, the, I can't do any more, you know, tension. Uh, he, my fondness for him allows me to do it. Now, now comes along Star Wars in concert, which I've known about for about four years. Really? And I'll tell you that I was against the idea, because I said, if you want to see music and film, go, go to the movies. Right. Don't see all Star <laughs> They are used to me being critical and kind of... Why? Why are you? Why? Why? Would it's it's you? in my nature to be. You know, I didn't want to meet George. I, did, I didn't want to be in this. Under what happened? You were I, doing Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Yeah, and that was no interest. Yeah, because you know I was serious. Rather, I was getting jobs all the time. I was running from one to another. I had no ambition other than to act on stage right. or on TV. Or I'd never even thought of films. You know, we're talking a long time ago. I don't think I ever thought I'd have the clout to be in a movie. It was like too big. It's like, no, I'm, well, I'm not worthy, absolutely not worthy. Now, a lot of actors kind of suffer from that feeling, and, and they, get over, they, have to get, they have to get over it, otherwise they'd never work. But I think there is a kind of weird balance between modesty and, uh, or fear and modesty, and needing to break out and saying, and there are times I hear myself sounding, like I was in concert, you know, I feel very much in charge because my words trigger off all these gigantic effects that happen around me and everybody else. So gigantic, it wasn't until I saw a video of the recording of the O2 Arena in London that I could see just how big it was. You know, I look like an action, a tiny action figure on stage. My face is this big on screen and I'm there. It's an almighty event and my key words triggers the orchestra, the lights, the lasers, whatever. Such a feeling of power. And it also, hopefully, even more powerful, controls the audience. That I'm about to speak. Listen. And I do. Oh, that's such a magical feeling. It's lucky I'm not on the dark side, because believe me, I could wipe out the galaxy. <laughs> 
you know, so really half my life so far has been Star Wars. And I haven't always understood it. I've had the scripts, hardly ever understood those. Apart from my own. Like, they're very complicated, really. There's a lot of stuff in these movies. But this event, I think above, above all, maybe it began, I now realize that I have had, in the last few years an epiphany, a, a, a change of spiritual soul, if you like. Um, and it started with a very large fan celebration thing, where there were maybe 40,000 fans in front of me at some point, like they're in front of everybody at some point, but I looked at all these people and thought, I don't really get what they get, because I'm, and I'll come to something George said to me the other day, apropos of whatever, he, he just said, you know, you and I can never be fans, because he said, we made the films. Obviously huge, I mean, two statements there, huge gems, he made the films, I was in the films. But actually, he cemented in my mind why I can't be a fan because I know how it's done. I know the tricks of the trade. I know, you know, the people you don't see because the camera's not looking at them. And it wasn't until I did this big event in California with 40,000 people, all enjoying something that I knew about, um, but I didn't get. But I suddenly got, I suddenly got that they all got something that they loved. There was a, a communal love affection, interest, any words like that, that has given them so much. And I thought, well, who am I to not understand that? And so I have moved up a level. And the interesting thing you were asking me about me being now a spokesperson, for very technical reasons, either that um, characters were replaced by their earlier beings as young people, or the characters we replaced by digital imagery. I am the only person to actually work on all six, and now with the Clone Wars series, all seven movies. So in a, a human way, I am the, the line, the thread, the safety rope that goes right, right, right through all of them. And of course, I didn't mean for any of this to happen. It's all fallen on me by the grace of what George Lucas and maybe said, some kind of higher, maybe the force, I don't know. It is a kind of, I suppose it's a kind of schizophrenia. I do very easily separate the two of them. Sure. So in a way I can look at him objectively, and well I have to because I think he's a nice person and I take care of him. Right. But I'm interested actually, you give me the image of, of our previous talk where there was the, the big costume behind me and you know I was there for the, the bigger picture of um, the, the exhibition. And now, in a way, having the small character with me now uh, puts it in perspective that actually Star Wars in concert is, is my time to, to be the, the main character. And John Williams has reworked his scores so that they came together in sync. And every night, the conductor gets it by using white screens, just as you would in a scoring session to get an 86-piece orchestra and a choir to come together at that same moment as on the screen. And here, here, and I haven't seen it, I've seen a drawing, a concept of it, you have the enormous um, stadium screen down the center. So I will be at one end backed by the orchestra and our 100-foot screen. And then down the center, you have the enormous uh, Stadium, the Cowboy Stadium, Cowboy Stadium, stadium. right? It has to be sixty so, yard long. Yeah. So this is an aspect for me that is going to be overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. So at times, you know, my eyes are going to be. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this Wait. is the Dallas is the probably the biggest venue in the world. Obviously. Well, you know, they don't call it the Death Star for nothing. Do they call it the Death Star? They do. Wow. That is one of its nicknames. Wow. Well, of course, I've been in the Death Star before, many times. Yes, um, but this venue actually is nicknamed <laughs> by many locals as the Death Star. Is it really? It is. I haven't heard that. Okay. Well, I'm sure I'll escape alive like I did last time. So. I, I, I can only hope you do.